Uh, welcome again, everyone, um, and good morning. I'm Tanya Howe. I'm one of the Family Assistance Program Specialists with the Office of Family Assistance, and I have the honor of introducing to you today our three presenters for today's session. Um, so we have Erin Frisch, who is from the Child Support um, Office. I'm sorry, she's a Child Support Director in the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Would you like to come on up? Um, then we have Mamani Gray, who is the Fatherhood Coordinator with Nature's Playhouse. And Demetrius Starling, who's the Senior Deputy Director of the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. So we will wrap up about 15 minutes early to give you guys time for Q&As. The mic mics are in the back, uh, as you'll see them on the stand, and then I have someone else that's running around uh, with a mic as well, if you don't get a chance to go back to the mic. So well, please welcome our presenters. Well, thank, thank, so okay. okay. I think I will start. Uh, my name is uh, Bomani Gray. I'm the uh, project director for uh, Map Fee, which is Michigan Action Plan for Fathers Involvement. Um, starting in 2019, we uh, received a grant from the Fatherhood uh, research and practi practice network um, that came down through Aaron. And Aaron reached out to U of M. Uh, we would like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Richard Tolman that's here uh, that really uh, worked with the uh, Matt Fee Project. And the Matt Fee Project was a project with the vision to uh, build a uh, bridge between child support and the uh, OCS, or what we call in Michigan, the Friends of the Court. Um, I don't know if anybody ever has a great experience with the Friends of the Court. You can raise your hand out there. Okay, all right. <laughs> so uh, one of our pieces was trying to uh, rewrite the narrative that uh, in Michigan that fathers would always say, uh, Friends of Court is no friend of mine and um, just try to build that relationship with the courts uh, at the time, and we're still doing that. So uh, recently, I'll just give you a small backstory. We just started, uh, we just received a funding from Kellogg for three years to, to continue this work and then take the action plan into actually a uh, vision and mission that we're trying to do here. So that's when I work with Demetrius and Aaron on that piece of trying to work with dads, um, supporting policies, uh, looking at language in there, and we work together. We have a, a committee that is a collaboration of professionals that are from attorneys to uh, professionals that work in the child support and practitioners that's all around Michigan. So our board is very diverse and we work together with some, uh, some of the child support issues or some policies that's there. Uh, with that being said, I think I will go to, the, oh, the clicker? Uh, we don't. Oh, there's a button up there. This one? All right. So, yeah, so those are some of the areas that we uh, covered. I think I kind of like went through there. Yeah, so we had, uh, go back. Our, no, that's good, right there, Demetrius. So we, also we worked with uh, Wayne State. Um, two years later, I think the big part was working, we did a, uh, another one that was in Detroit. Detroit is the uh, major hub where, uh, in Wayne County in Michigan. So we have a Metro Detroit policy group that we work with the uh, OCS to work on some data to kind of like figure out where we should be giving service to those men uh, in the community. Uh, with that, I think it's Aaron maybe, right? And these are some of the few things that we are doing here. Um, 
identifying and mapping. Uh, we did a map for our website, collectively trying to show fatherhood um, resources all through the state, uh, which was important because a lot of times agencies, smaller agencies sometimes um, are not longer there, so we try to update our map to make sure those services for the practitioners that work all around the state, they are able to reach out to those agencies uh, for fatherhood resources. And I think I talked about the funding that we received through Kellogg, uh, which we have for three years to actually turn this plan into an actual uh, organization, um, like a nonprofit organization, and still work with uh, the child support system. And this is an example of the map where all of the uh, fatherhood programs are. Uh, one of the things that we uh, identified was uh, that's kind of difficult is, um, I don't know, up in the UP is uh, Native American uh, families and cultures. So that is our next objective is trying to get more fatherhood programs in the UP uh, on our map. But this map will be able to work with anybody in the state where you can just identify fatherhood programs throughout Michigan. And so I'll turn it over to Demetrius on this one. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Demetrius Starling. I am the Senior Deputy Director over Children's Services with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. So basically what that entails is 83 counties uh, where we have around 3,700 employees that spans across the child welfare continuum. So prevention, preservation, child protective services, foster care, adoption, licensing and guardianship programs and juvenile justice programs fall under my purview. And in each and every sector of all those continuums, I think it's pretty safe to say that there is a place for authentic fatherhood engagement, especially on the front ends of our systems. And I want to talk about that a little bit more in regards to what drives the department has, my administration has, in tandem with folks like Bomani and Aaron. So <clears throat> what we've implemented in Michigan, uh, as in other states, we have what is called the Family Resource Centers. So we have right now 12 family resource centers that are across the state that offer really concrete services for our families who are in need. So we service the most neediest families and part of that also is our, our endeavors to change from a child welfare system to a family well-being system. So in the past, we've really leaned into the whole, you know, let's make sure that all services and supports are in place for children, which, you know, was, was accurate and true at the time. But what we've learned in our child welfare systems is if, if you don't really embody the whole family, especially the fathers, sometimes families fail. And sometimes you're so centrally focused on what the child needs and not what the family needs are, sometimes our systems fail. So with that, you know, implementation of our family resource centers that we offer, you know, a, a gauntlet of services uh, in different areas. So we have fatherhood support programs, we have visitation programs in our family resource centers. We have a place where we could have uh, parental supports, whether it be maternal or paternal supports, uh, that folks can come in and have some discussions about how can I be an active father? How can I make sure that you know, I'm meeting all the needs of, of my children and my family at this time. And with that, we started to have some really robust discussion about not just having a bricks and mortar uh, concept across our state, but how do we have also our staff that can be engaged and activated for these families. So as a result, we came up with what is called our FIT teams, which is our family impact teams. And you know, it really ties into the work that we have right now, specifically around social determinants of health. We all know that when there is a lack of access to food, there's housing insecurity, food instability, lack of access to mental health services, that families fail. And we know that there is a key point and juncture that we need to engage our fathers to ensure they're a part of the family structure, the conversations, which we haven't seen in the past. So for folks, do I have any child welfare professionals here? Okay, so as you, as in other jurisdictions, the CPS referral comes in in the name of the mom. And unfortunately, in far too many situations, 
there's a, 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 not a lot of information or any made mention about a father. We all know kids didn't come here through Immaculate Conception, right? There has to be a father somewhere. So how do we take that next step to engage these fathers to get them you know, activated with their families and so they can demonstrate that resiliency? And our family impact teams are really important in that aspect. So we have family impact teams where we have staff that are embedded in all of our child welfare staffs. Well, they're going to be in all of our child welfare staffs across the state. Right now, we're in 17 counties. We're piloting these programs where our family impact teams you know, really are working upstream to work with fathers and other uh, people in the family to provide concrete and economic supports so we can deflate that, that conflation of poverty and neglect and really meet parents where they're at. We've heard directly from fathers who are, are stating, man, if I can just get access or help around getting transportation, or you know, some of the success stories that we've heard recently, is that there was a father who was you know, taking care of his three kids on his own. And he, you know, he was working two jobs, and his kids uh, sometimes had to go to school with soiled clothes because they didn't have a washer and a dryer. This man would walk three miles just to wash his kids' clothes. So there was a CPS complaint that came in through our centralized intake that came from the school administrators, said, hey, we're worried about this father. We're worried about these kids. They're coming to school. You know, their clothes are soiled. You know, they have a slight smell to them. So our family impact team got involved right away. They were able to get the dad not only bus passes to make sure that he was getting his kids back and forth to school, but also bought a brand new washer, brand new dryer, and provided him with six months of laundry soap and also uh, dryer sheets. <laughs> he wrote one of the most heartfelt letters that I've ever read from a customer, just thanking us profusely about you know, having access to some of the concrete services that we all take for, for granted, right? I think most of us can probably say that we don't worry about a wash and dryer at some point, unless it breaks down like mine did about a year ago. Um, but at the same time, these are things that we take for granted that our families need to thrive on their own. Have so many stories like that that we've heard from our folks across the state relative to how fathers are now feeling a part of their family structure because we're providing some of those concrete and economic supports. Our department is bifurcated, so we have the economic stability side where, you know, folks are doing eligibility, you know, TANF-related entitlement programs, uh, you know, Medicaid programs. And on the child welfare side, we have, of course, you know, all the continuum that I listed earlier. So to have this marriage of both sides of our department and to have someone who's in the middle that's the glue of all this has been amazing to see um, uh, in, in work. So again, you know, these are some of the things that we see, and the, the numbers don't lie. Whenever we can get involved on the front end of our systems, there's a 50% decrease in child welfare interaction. 50% decrease, right? And what we see, we've seen from our, our initial numbers is that when we have fit teams that have been activated in these respective counties, there's a 75% chance or increase of father's involvement. Just want to pause there for a second. 75 increase, percent increase of fathers being involved. There's stigma that's attached sometimes when fathers don't have access to the resources they need to be active fathers. You know, we've heard from our fathers that you know, they're depressed, they don't, they don't feel like you know, they're of any benefit to their families, and we feel like this is just one small piece of the puzzle to help fathers be more engaged. So helping out with public assistance programs, supporting, navigating resources, referrals to community partners, and flexible funding purposes. And it works towards greater rates of permanency, getting the courts out of the, the lives of our families at a much quicker pace, decreased reoccurrence. You know, we have maltreatment of care is an issue or a concern when we have kids who are placed in, in homes of non-custodial parents, which in a lot of cases are our fathers. But if they get those concrete and economic supports on the front end, we see our maltreatment and care rates start to go down. Also, placement stability. Fathers are feeling you know, encouraged. They're not feeling as discouraged as they were in the past, so they're able to keep their home stable. You know, we've had stories about fathers who 
uh, were about to lose their home to bankruptcy. You know, we were able to pay off their bills, pay off their liens. So now they're feeling, they're feeling encouraged. They're not feeling discouraged. They're not feeling as if you know, they're not man enough. And that's the stigma that we have to attack aggressively, that it's not you. We're here as a department to assist in some of those barriers. I think most of us could say we have family members or friends or even ourselves who are one bad situation away from being in this demographic. So your zip code or you know, your, the level of pay that you receive should not determine your outcome. We have families who are in disenfranchised, marginalized communities that sometimes are overlooked. So we have a heavy focus on black and brown families and our tribal families within Michigan to ensure they have the concrete and economic supports as fathers to be successful. So right now we're going through several phases. Um, I've been with the department now for about 25 years and I was a child uh, protective services worker when I first started with the department and I saw how some of our own policies and our procedures and our practices heavily impacted our families, more specifically fathers. And you know, there have been at least two instances where myself or my peers tried to lift up fatherhood initiatives at the time our department was not ready, I think for lack of a better term. Um, but we feel like right now with the momentum that we're getting with good thought partners like Aaron and Bomani and others who are stakeholders in our community that we have enough fortified strength behind us to ensure that fatherhood initiatives are paramount for the governor's office and for our administration. So phase one is that we really try to unravel, unwrap some of the historical implications, implications of social work. Uh, so just really tapping back on some of the, the negative connotations about, you know, deadbeat dads or absent fathers. There's a story behind every situation. There's a reason why some fathers are not as engaged or in part of our child, of our, uh, our, their family's lives. And sometimes child welfare systems are a big part of that. We can be negative, we can be judgmental, we can be disparaging. So a big part of that was, you know, myself and my administration having some really tough discussions with our staff on the front end about how you engage authentically with our families. I don't know if many folks are aware of FFPSA, our Families First uh, Prevention Act. One of the, the uh, services within our clearinghouse is called motivational interviewing. And it's a, a basic you know, a interviewing style, well not a basic, but a more enhanced interviewing style, really teaching our staff how you engage our parents, our fathers, from a level of respect, honoring their voice, and honoring who they are versus just coming here with a checklist and saying, well, we need to make sure the kids are safe, well-being, the cupboards are full. That's all important. But how do you team? How do you engage? How do you assess? And how do you mentor our families? Which fits into our Michigan case practice model, really comports with the, the, uh, the interviewing uh, te technology or uh, methodology that we're implementing right now. So again, we've, we did a really thorough scrub of all our policies, our procedures. My chief of staff, uh, Regina Branch, who's probably at home watching this, um, probably a hardest working woman uh, in Michigan right now, she's actually done visits with families. She goes out uh, in the community with our child protective services workers, not as an aha gotcha moment, but just to kind of teach and coach and edify our staff about well, why didn't you ask this about our fathers? You know, why didn't you ask this about our fathers? What did you get from that? And as a result, we're building different processes, different trainings for our staff as we get into phase two. And phase two is to review our TANF dollars to see if there's any way that we can uh, uplift uh, different, more enhanced services. So we're looking at how do we, for instance, one of the ideas that we have right now is that not only maternal and paternal, uh, growth, but how do we engage fathers in regards to if you're in a relationship with, you know, your mother, with the mother of your children, how do we engage you uh, if you want to actually be married to this woman? How do we engage you from a fatherhood and faith-based initiative perspective? Embedding some of those ideas around 
fatherhood, faith, taking initiative in your community, being more engaged are some of the things that we're looking to do with some of our RFPs going forward. Um, I talked about the partnership with Economic Stability, Office of Child Support, and Department of Corrections. I have to give so much credit to this woman to my left because she has been an amazing thought partner. She's been a champion of fathers. Um, and I know it, it hasn't been an easy path for her uh, because some of her own policies and procedures, she had to do a deeper examination, of course, to see how we can do better and be better for our fathers. But she is the voice of reason and a champion for this work. So I just want to give her a big shout out and give her her roses. <laughs> and as we all know, we, we can't make instrumental change and make well-informed decisions and look at ways that we can provide services and, and other uh, different service arrays without the data. So we have tracking mechanisms now in place in regards to how many fathers we engage on a monthly basis um, in, our, in our CPS cases. When we get down the road towards foster care, you know, we, we track our genograms to see if there was actually any discussion about a father. If kids are going to our juvenile justice programs and they're you know, being placed in juvenile justice facilities, how are we ensuring that fathers are a part of the visits too? So we're tracking all this. We're making sure that we have this, this keen mindset and not this myopic view of child welfare going forward because we want to look at transportation services, housing services, parental services, uh, mental and behavioral health services for our fathers going forward. So I know that was a mouthful. I'm going to turn it over to Erin so she can provide more input. Thanks, Demetrius. Um, I'm Erin Frisch. I am the director of the Office of Child Support in Michigan, a job I've had coming up on 12 years. And uh, I have found uh, when I talk to folks who are supporting fathers, uh, folks have some feelings about the child support program uh, and how helpful or harmful we, we may have been. So often I start out by saying, I, as Michigan Child Support Director, and a sort of nice white lady, uh, want to say uh, we recognize that we cause harm as a program to fathers. And uh, it is not enough just to recognize it. Uh, we also need to think about how we're going to do things differently. And uh, when I say that in groups, uh, where there are fathers present, um, generally there's a sort of collective sigh that happens. We're like, thank you for saying the thing out loud <laughs> that we need you to say. Um, and what I will say about uh, the Michigan Action Plan for Father Involvement is uh, when Dr. Tolman called me and said, hey, there's these grants uh, that the National Fatherhood Research Practice Network is doing. Um, we had a mutual friend in that organization, and uh, she connected us. Uh, and when he said, hey, do you want to do something in this space? I said, absolutely. One of the things that I think was really foresightful about those grants was that the child support director had to be uh, engaged in those projects. Uh, I want to be clear, I'm not the only child support director in this country doing fatherhood work. <laughs> and in fact, I would say the work that we are doing is uh, pretty uh, basic at this point. There's still plenty to do. Mm -hmm. uh, when we put together Matt B, uh, initially there were a couple other folks that were really key in uh, getting this off the ground that I want to mention. The first is Ellen Wood. Ellen was my paternity establishment liaison in the Office of Child Support. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second was Amy Lindholm, who is here today. Who worked <laughs> Amy is as passionate as anyone about the role of fathers in families' lives. And having uh, an important partner in the courts makes all the difference when you're trying to make change happen, especially mm -hmm. in a program like the Child Support Program. So thanks, Amy, yeah. for your uh, helping keeping us on track and moving forward. Um, when we first uh, started putting that feed together, it was really important to us that we had um, folks who were doing the work in community, and folks who worked in organizations like Demetrius's and mine, uh, 
who are making decisions about what happens to their families. Uh, and one of the slides that Bonani had sh showed you know, all the different groups that we have uh, that participate in mapping. And our initial goal was to create a fatherhood commission in Michigan. That was what we got the grant money for. That's what we were going to go do. And okay. Thank you. Thanks. I promise I didn't touch any buttons. <laughs> um, I'm going to lose this one. Uh, OK, that's much better. I can even hear myself better. Um, so uh, when we first got MAPFI together, we really wanted, uh, our goal was to create a fatherhood commission in Michigan. Uh, I'm here to tell you, we don't have a fatherhood commission in Michigan yet. Um, what that group was able to do, though, is start to build relationships across the state between practitioners and folks like uh, me and Demetrius who uh, are over these programs that have a lot of impact on families' lives. And I have met folks that work in state government doing fatherhood work that I didn't know about because of MAPV. Um, from Department of Labor, from Department of Corrections, and those relationships help us organize internally around making sure that we are uh, looking towards systemic change. It has also built incredible relationships with folks who work outside the department, uh, like uh, Rich and Bomani and others, and that has provided a level of accountability to me uh, that I value and really has helped uh, drive change happen. So uh, some of the things I think that are worth uh, lifting up that child support programs uh, can do and why it's important that when we go into organizations like MAPFI, when we, these coalitions get built, we don't come in as I'm from the state and I know all the answers and I have the money and I'm going to tell you all how it's going to be. Uh, it was really important to me that when uh, we participate as the Office of Child Support in this group, uh, that we are a partner, that we can follow the lead of the folks who know more about what needs to change, and also bring the considerable resources that I have available to me. So one of the things that I have found really helpful with MAPV is uh, I hear from fatherhood practitioners all the time, we don't understand how the budget process works. And so we can't figure out how to get access to funds. Well, I know how the budget process works in state government. So I can say, well, here's, here's when it starts. Here's the process. Um, Demetrius and I can work together to make uh, budget proposals, which we have done in the past, um, to advance the goals of MAPV. And I get to hear, these are the things we actually care about, not maybe the things you think we should be caring about. And that helps direct us into how do we leverage the systems and the resources we have available to us. Um, the other uh, ways in which uh, MAPV has been helpful is I have found um, that the more that we build relationship across community organizations and state organizations, the more we recognize uh, there's opportunity to help each other. And in Michigan, we've been able to leverage uh, our relationships with fatherhood organizations to really help us understand better what the program means uh, and can change. So uh, I think there's a couple examples that I want to highlight. Uh, and I'm going to pick on a couple that were partnerships, actually, with child welfare. Um, and the first was. Uh, the work that we did to get um, CPS workers access to the fatherhood registry, uh, the paternity registry in Michigan. So for a minute, uh, I was the chief deputy for opportunity in the state, and one of the things I did was went on a ride along with the CPS worker, enlightening stuff. Uh, and in that day that I spent with her, um, it became clear that she had no information about fa the father, or who the father was, or where they were. Mm -hmm. And um, child support has access to this paternity registry where we can go see everybody uh, in the state that's uh, in vital records. And it uh, took a couple of years, but we've been able to make that resource available now for the CPS workers. Um, which means uh, better information, better access. 
the policy, big policy change we've made in the last year uh, with, I would say, guidance and leadership from the Federal Children's Bureau and Office of Child Support Services uh, was how we handle child support in cases where a child is in foster care. Uh, so for many, 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 many years, uh, routinely, regularly, as a matter of course, children went into foster care, uh, the foster care system sent a referral to child support and we would try to obtain a child support order on both of those parents where the child was removed. Folks familiar with that process? Uh, thanks to some really great research um, out of uh, University of Wisconsin, uh, out of Minnesota and out of California, the data became really clear that we were not actually being helpful in any of our goals with that uh, process. We were not actually putting more money into the hands of families. Uh, and we weren't uh, recovering, because that was the other component of this program, is we weren't recovering funds that were um, quote unquote due to the state for a child being in foster care or to the county. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember, <laughs> it was when Steve Yeager was still the child welfare director, so it's been a minute, mm -hmm. probably six years ago maybe. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, and I went to them and I said, hey, you all get to decide whether you send us child welfare referrals or not. And I would submit to you that perhaps maybe you don't want to do that anymore. Uh, and they were like, oh, okay, sure, no problem. And then we started having some conversations with folks in the counties and they were like, oh, no, no, you're not going to stop that process. We're not going to, we're not going to go for that. Uh, and last year uh, with Demetrius's leadership, we were able to change that process. And so we are no longer creating child support orders uh, in cases where a child is in foster care. Uh, because what we recognize is we're pulling resources out of that family when we really need to be pulling resources into that family. Um, we also are hoping still to get rid of a whole bunch of debt we have on the books on the child support side uh, in those cases, debt that's owed to the, uh, basically owed, owed to the state and the federal government uh, for child welfare services. Um, that, again, is not helping anybody and is creating, oper or creating big holes for payers that they're really struggling to get out of and we're trying to break that cycle of that constant debt uh, that tends to build up in a child support case. So that's a, another, I think, uh, way in which uh, getting the right systems players in the room together, mm -hmm. you can make policy change like that and systems change. Um, and I will, I will say that, you know, when we started to get the, oh, the counties are going to lose money, uh, we had a commitment across both organizations that we were going to figure out a way to make that okay. Uh, and working with the state budget office and the legislature, we're able to do that uh, through the budget process. We also uh, have found opportunities to work uh, with the courts uh, and understanding the roles and importance of uh, father voice in uh, the child support system on a you know case by case basis but then also on a, a larger basis uh, and uh, in 2021 we created a child support community advisory council in michigan and that uh, is a, a group that's uh, relatively small about 14 15 people parents caregivers payers, recipients, community members, with an intentional focus on marginalized communities that are disproportionately represented in the child support program. So really wanting to make sure we created opportunity for voice for folks who don't uh, have their voices heard very often. Uh, that advisory council uh, has become an incredible partner for us. Our goal was to use that advisory council not just as a um, co-signing of what we were already planning on doing, but really using them uh, to share with us what uh, they thought was important. And one of the things that uh, they spent a year, they spent a year us learning about their experiences um, and them learning about child support. And at the end of that year, they created a report with some recommendations for me about uh, what they thought needed to change. The very first thing on that list was we need help navigating this very complicated process. And that was true for moms and dads, for payers and recipients. And um, 
my first response was, well, uh, but what, if, what about like just making the program work better? What about making it simpler, easier to use, more accessible? And they all said, well, that is great, and that's going to take you time, and we don't have time. So you keep working on that part and help us figure out how to get uh, what we need to get what we need to, to support our children. One of the things that I have found helpful to reframe child support folks' heads around sometimes is to think about the program, not as the child support program, but as the parent support program. Mm. And if we are supporting parents, what does that look like? Because honestly, in child support, when we talk about we're here for the child, we're, we're implying that that's because parents aren't or can't or won't. Mm -hmm. um, and I uh, really think that if we were more focused on supporting parents to support their own children, we would get out of our own way a lot more often. Uh, that advisory council came up with this navigator idea. It took me uh, two years to find the funding uh, to be able to pilot that. And last week, uh, we kicked off that navigator pilot in four counties in Michigan. And uh, we are testing a few different models about how this can work in um, Genesee County, in Flint, Michigan, uh, we are partnering with one of our MAPFEE partners uh, to provide navigator services. Uh, and so a quick shout out to Sean Hart and Involved Dad and the work you all are doing. Um, and uh, the friend of the court in Genesee County uh, and Involved Dad had already had a really strong relationship and have learned um, how to help each other uh, help people be successful through the child support program. And so we're able to build on that relationship and provide navigators uh, through Involved Dad. In uh, Wayne County, which is where Detroit is, the folks are state staff and they are being housed in local community organizations. Uh, so they are not sitting in the courthouse, they're not sitting in the um, child support office, they are in community and they're there to help answer questions, fill out forms, uh, get uh, uh, um, not legal advice, because we've got a whole rule around that, uh, but help figuring out where to go next if they need legal advice. Um, and I really look at this program as the start um, of a way to, to reimagine child support actually providing services uh, since we've, we're all about that name now, we've, we've you know, dropped enforcement. Uh, we have work to do to make sure we're actually providing those services so they can help connect uh, parents to other assistance programs and other benefits, um, community resources. Uh, you know, they, those ad, um, navigators know who to call uh, to help get that individual what they need no matter where their struggle is in the child support program. Uh, I expect where we learn over the next two years uh, will teach us a lot. What I found interesting when we first uh, put this pilot together was that everything that we're doing is already considered Title IV-D fundable child support work. It's not extra or different or outside of what we're already supposed to be doing. Um, and that sort of hit home for me in a way uh, that has me continuing to reimagine what does child support look like in families' lives. We've also, um, I think you heard uh, one of the folks this morning talk about uh, the Office of Child Support Services, OCSS, um, has a regulation, proposed regulation change that would allow us to draw down federal funding for employment services for child support. In Michigan, we've been doing this uh, for the last four years through our GEMS program, uh, and we were able to do that with a waiver from the federal government uh, to do an experiment. Uh, we have tested uh, employment services led through child support a couple of different ways um, and learned a lot along the way. GEMS is a program for child support payers who are unemployed or underemployed uh, to get access to employment services and also case management services at the same time. So we can, you know, um, abate your support for a period of time while you're looking for a job. Uh, we can look at the arrears forgiveness programs that are available in Michigan to help folks um, get out of some of the debt that has built up. 
uh, and they get access to uh, Michigan Works in Michigan, which is where the um, Workforce Development Services are uh, mainly housed, and we've built some really great relationships. Uh, and what I found through that was that, you know, the the courts are doing their thing, and the the labor folks are doing their thing, and there wasn't a lot of relationship uh, at the county level between those groups. Uh, and just building that has opened up opportunity for us to provide services differently. Uh, we also um, leveraged a federal option to no longer keep charging child support when someone's incarcerated. And I will be honest, 12 years ago when I first started uh, as Michigan's child support director and someone first came to set me and said, you know, we really need to think specifically about uh, the incarcerated population. I, I'm ashamed to say it, but I was like, I got, I got more important things to worry about than that. The work we've done through our equity and inclusion work has helped me understand that that is um, the wrong way to look at any population uh, in our caseload. And as a result, we have uh, been able to form some relationships and partnerships in Department of Corrections uh, to uh, look at the ways in which child support uh, cannot be an unnecessary burden uh, when someone's uh, coming out of incarceration and trying to get themselves uh, into stable, reliable support so that they can, you know, pay, uh, pay their support, see their kids, get through life. One of the other things we started, and um, Bomani is on this team as well, uh, three years now, I think it's been, um, was an anti-racism transformation team. So in 2017, I came to my executive management team and I said, hey, I think we we have a responsibility to think about how child support as a system is part of the overall system that is keeping certain people groups marginalized and oppressed. And uh, we have to reckon and reconcile that. Uh, and that really was the genesis of much of the work that I'm talking about here, is when we finally said, oh, we've got, we've got a problem. Uh, we gotta be part of the solution. So everyone in my office is required to attend a one-day Introduction to Systemic Racism workshop. And we provide a deeper dive analysis workshop to those who are interested. Uh, and through that organizing work within my office and with the overall child support program, we created an anti-racism transformation team that is really looking at what do we do to transform child support specifically through an anti-racist lens. Uh, and recognizing that leading with race is not at the exclusion of other marginalized groups, uh, but that leading with race allows us to solve for many marginalized groups. Um, that team has its own strategic plan. It has uh, been working to learn uh, from each other and educate. That team is made up of child support professionals, attorneys, court staff, community members, parents, and caregivers. Uh, and there was a lot of um, relationship building that needed to be done, a lot of trust that needed to be built before we could make that work. Some of the other policy changes that we've been working through that I think are uh, helpful um, to mention, and I think there's a couple more on the other slide too, um, and one that we've been working on for the 12 years that I've been the child support director is, um, eliminating the process that existed in Michigan, uh, and Michigan was one of three states left doing this, where if uh, parents weren't together and Medicaid paid for the birth of that child, uh, dad was required to pay back Medicaid for the expense of the birth of that child. Didn't matter if those parents were actually together living in the same house but not married and on Medicaid, uh, it didn't matter if that baby was born in a hospital or not. Uh, and uh, I'm very pleased to say that we were finally able to get in our fiscal year 25 budget the authorization to stop doing that anymore. Wow. Well done. <laughs> Uh, we are also forgiving about $14 million in debt for parents um, attributable to this birth expense requirement. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, 
$14 million honestly is not that much money in our department's budget, in the Medicaid budget, in my budget. But we know for those families, $14 million is going to be a big deal. Uh, it, could, it could mean the closure of their child support case. It could mean significant change in the enforcement actions that are being taken on that case. And um, the great thing is uh, partnering with the Medicaid agency and us sort of uh, locking arms and working through the process together is what was able to make that happen, uh, along with the support of our department. Uh, we're also changing our cooperation requirements. So if you're familiar with child support, then you know that if you're receiving cash assistance, then you are automatically required to have a child support order, whether you want one or not. In Michigan, that has also been true, not just for cash assistance, but for food assistance, for child care assistance, and for Medicaid. Uh, Michigan was one of the few states that no matter what assistance type you were getting, you were going to have a child support order, whether you wanted one or not. And uh, working with our Economic Stability Administration, uh, we had a similar conversation to the one we had uh, with Demetrius and his team about, hey, maybe child support isn't so helpful in some of these cases. Uh, and we uh, last, I have to think about what time of year we're in. Uh, earlier this year, uh, we eliminated that requirement for the child care cases. So we're no longer, you're no longer required as a term of eligibility for child care to have a child support case also. Uh, and we are doing the same thing for food assistance uh, coming up in, before the end of the calendar year. That's huge. That's huge. Uh, people say to me all the time, like, aren't you worried? Aren't you worried that no one will have child support anymore? And, and I like to say, well, if I have to force people to use my program, it's probably not working very well. <laughs> um, and in this process that we're developing now, uh, we will still get noticed, we will still become aware when a family is on food assistance or receiving child care assistance, uh, and we will uh, proactively offer the child support services to that family. Uh, and then they get to say yes or no. And if they say no, we say no problem, you don't have to talk to us anymore, we're here if you need us later, if something changes, you can always come back around. Um, if they say yes, then we will explain to them what will happen. Um, part of the reason that this policy exists in the first place is the nature of the child support program to do cost recovery. Uh, and so I'm sure folks here are familiar with the fact that um, when Title IV-D of the Social Security Act uh, was signed in 1975, one of the roles uh, that folks thought would be important for child support is, I say, be the, the debt collectors for the department. Um, and many states are now moving out of that um, way of thinking. Unfortunately, we collect a lot of money for the government. Um, and I'm a firm believer that uh, we should not be running our government programs on the backs of poor people. And that means we need to change that fundamental model of how child support works from a cost recovery perspective. So for us, that has looked like we no longer require, um, for current assistance cases, current TANF cases, any current support that comes in goes directly to the family. We no longer intercept any of that money to pay back the uh, federal and state government. It also means that I pay out of Michigan's pocket the federal government uh, their share of what they would have gotten of that money uh, because they still want their share. Uh, and we are continuing to look at how we do that for our former assistance caseload, which is a much larger component of our caseload, uh, so that we're pushing all of that money directly to families and we're not keeping any of it anymore. Uh, the, you know, the, the conversation has been, well, since I have skin in the, I, since I care about whether the state and federal government's getting their share, then that's why you have to cooperate. Well, if I don't care anymore about why you're getting your share, then the only reason I'm making you cooperate is so that I can surveil you because you're not a fam you're a family that has been in the system somewhere. Uh, and uh, again, I don't think child support should be the surveillance tool of the state and federal government. Um, so the more opportunities we give folks to have choice, to have autonomy uh, over what ha is happening to them, we can educate them about what is happening to them. 
um, and they feel like uh, they are in control, uh, we see much better results when it comes to collecting child support, honestly. Like, I mean, I'm doing this because I think it's the right thing to do, but I am the child support director, and my job is to collect child support. Let's, I'm not going to, you know, mince words about that. Uh, but we see better collection rates when parents feel like they are active participants in what is happening. Um, and this narrative we've had in child support for many years around um, uh, dads aren't responsible unless we make them be responsible. Um, is a narrative that started out of this, um, out of these myths that we were taught about what does it mean um, to be a low income family? What does it mean to be a black and brown family? Um, I like to say the child support program was not created for black and brown families and yet they are the more representative families in our program today. Uh, so there's opportunity I think for us to continue to improve and I have found Matt Fee to be an incredible accountability partner, because when I show up to those meetings every month and I get asked to report out, I gotta have something to say. Uh, and that means we gotta go do some stuff, so I got something to say. We um, have also been able to think about uh, how we meet fathers where they are, uh, how do we gain lived experience insight, so we've built a human-centered design practice in our office, uh, which uh, means that for almost every uh, systems change, policy decision, budgetary decision we're making, we have a vehicle by which to go and talk to the folks who will be impacted by that decision. Uh, that is rooted in our equity impact assessment process uh, that we use on a regular basis and continue to make part of the culture in our office, uh, and that has helped us bring insight not only to the folks who are writing the policy, but also uh, in partnership uh, with the court's practitioners as well in bringing in fathers to tell their stories. Uh, it also gives us opportunity to collaborate in new and different ways uh, and bring, again, the resources that we have to bear. What this has meant for our office is a, is a culture change, is a culture change around how we think about uh, dads, how we think about families, how we think about our role in families' lives, and um, there are, um, I hear folks on my staff saying now, like I used to not care about that thing, and I used to, I used to say I don't have time to care about that thing, right, I got too much to do, uh, and we don't, we don't say that anymore. Um, we look at our data. And what I can tell you from our data is black and brown fathers have twice as much child support debt as any other racial or ethnic group in Michigan. And black and brown mothers uh, have the lowest amount of child support ordered uh, compared to other racial and ethnic groups. Uh, which tells me I'm not really helping anybody on either side, right? I'm not setting orders that are getting um, that collections are coming in on that can be enough money for somebody to live on, and I'm also creating all this debt. So we still have lots of work to do, uh, and I am grateful that Matt Fee gives us an opportunity um, to collaborate and learn from and listen to our partners uh, who are out there doing the real work. And I'm always grateful um, that folks uh, let me show up in those spaces, uh, and it has been a real joy of mine uh, to think about how we make systems change uh, to really change the way that child support interacts with fathers and their families. And with that, I think we're gonna open it up for some questions. Um, so we have a couple here that we're curious about from you, but also if you have any questions for us. And I think if I remember right, there's mics. Yes, there's folks holding mics if folks have questions. And looking at, wow, okay, looking at the slides, how are we infusing entrepreneurial principles in helping our fathers generate the income so that they are able to not only work, but also pay back the rears, but also be fathers that can pay the bills and provide the services that 
our children need? How are we looking at entrepreneurial processes to help bridge that gap? Yeah, so what I can say from the child welfare perspective is that when we have our fathers who uh, present at our family resource centers, what we do is we have discussions about job readiness programs. As Aaron also mentioned, we have Michigan Works that we connect our fathers with. And we, we've also uh, recently engaged in conversations um, with entrepreneurs and uh, establishments and companies who wants to look at this next wave of the workforce. So for instance, uh, there's an individual, Ray Blast, uh, in Detroit. And what they're looking to do is bring on individuals who will be prepared for, uh, to service hybrid vehicles in the future. And uh, as we all know, uh, we're moving towards a 20, 35 day of, of emissions turnover from you know, gas powered vehicles to uh, EV vehicles. So you know, they've had discussions with us about how do we get fathers engaged to come to our programs. We'll pay for them to go through, I believe it's like 14 or 15 months of programs. And then from there, they'll be prepared for that, that next uh, workforce. But also, they're having discussions with them about financial literacy. If you want to start your own business at some juncture. So there are discussions that are occurring in pockets, but I think it's incumbent on us to be, you know, more broad with that conversation across the state. Yeah, and I think I would add to that with Matt Fee, I think uh, Aaron used uh, Sean Hart in Michigan, mm -hmm. who's doing his, his organization. He was a father first, and then he started building his organization out, which he's working now with uh, the, uh, OCS doing the navigating program and also when we do a fatherhood summit we are always are encouraging dads to participate uh, throughout the state of Michigan that may have wrote a book or a documentary and make sure that they're included in that piece also so we're trying to give that platform for those fathers uh, that are going into the entrepreneur field. And, and one, one more thing to that. So we also, through MAPFI, we've had the, the honor and the privilege of meeting other fathers who have had that, they have that lived expert voice. So we have, you know, not only folks like Sean, but we have an individual by the name of Cole Williams, who's an amazing thought partner in his work. He's been through the system, you know, and he is, a, you know, a successful businessman when it comes to using his platform to reach out to our kids in our juvenile justice programs. He does fatherhood trainings. Um, I think right now he's writing a comic book. So I think that the more we, we allow fathers or in these spaces where they can see individuals like Bomani, like Sean, like Cole, who have a story to tell and how they can use that as a platform going forward to not only build their empire, but also to reach others, I think it's important for us to do that as well. Yeah, Jeff Falkerson uh, from uh, Northern Virginia, uh, Prince William County, Manassas, Woodbridge, Manassas. Uh, my question, you know, centers around fathers being involved in community engagement. Like you have fathers that go through your program and they receive all these services, but they get, then they get to a point where they graduate. And how do you motivate these men to I guess be more involved in the change process, you know, reaching, uh, encouraging more fathers to be involved in their child's lives, young fathers, teenage fathers, you know, to be part of the process and really be mentors to them and show them how to, I mean, stand in the gap for your women. And you may not be married to the woman, but she's still the mother of your child. So being positive, keeping everything positive, but also being there for your child. So I'll just, I don't want to monopolize this. So <laughs> I think this group here is you know, a perfect example of how we can showcase those voices and honor those voices. I think that the more our fathers hear about Matthew and the work that we're doing together, I think it, it would encourage them to you know, be a part of different venues and, and platforms where they can to uh, talk about 
their experience. Additionally, uh, Aaron and I are working on something called the Dad's Cafe, where we'll have an opportunity to have fathers who are impacting their communities. You know, they have gone through certain systems uh, and they have a story to tell. And we'll, not to tokenize their voice, we, won't, we don't want it to seem as if our department is trying to use you uh, for the purposes of our fatherhood initiatives. No, this is a way that you can demonstrate to your community, to your families, with some of the hard work that's being done behind the scenes as a father. So, you know, we're gonna be rolling that out, hopefully, I don't wanna put a date on it, but sooner than later. Fall, we'll fall. fall. <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah. And I would say to that, that, um, uh, to have capacity in your own life to be engaged on a community level, you have to be well resourced. You have to have enough resources to, to not um, be worried about uh, when you're gonna see your kids next, where you know, you're gonna pay rent next, right? All of those things. And the, the folks uh, that are out there helping dads become better men, like Sean's program, like Cole's program, uh, I look at my job is to make sure they have the resources they need. Um, you know, the, the child support is big business in this country. And I, um, I recognize that uh, we are well funded and that is uh, one of my goals to figure out how we can create reliable, steady sources of financial resources to father or herd organizations so that they can help stand in the gap for those fathers so then those fathers can stand in the gap for their families. Um, I, do not, I do not know what it's like to be a dad, and I would never pretend to, um, but what I do know is that I can use the power that I have to support those organizations that know what it's like to be dad. Neil Tift, Native American Fathers and Families Association. Um, 30 years ago when I was running a father's program in Minnesota, we were part of the uh, Parents Fair Share with MDRC. And one of the options that came up for fathers who were unemployed and not living with the mother, but paternities was established, was rather than paying a stranger to provide childcare to the children, that the father would care for the children. And that way he was, it was, he didn't need to pay child support because he's supporting his children. Now I realize there are situations where that wouldn't be feasible, but is that ever on the table where fathers themselves can be part of the solution and be connected to their children and then the children have a father figure as well as a mother figure in their lives? Yeah, absolutely. I'm reminded of a story out of Muskegon, Michigan. Uh, in an earlier iteration of our fatherhood uh, employment program where we were working with an individual who um, was able to get a job, started um, paying his support. He was paying $25 a week. He was not paying a lot. But it was enough that um, his children's other parents saw that he was making an effort and uh, was able to rebuild a relationship there and then uh, realized uh, that he could actually better serve that family if he had the kids while she had a, a third shift job. Uh, and so he, he watched the kids while she went to work uh, as a way to support that family. And that was totally uh, acceptable way for, um, for that court to see uh, support happening. The other thing we've talked about for years, and I'm still trying to figure out uh, a way to do it effectively, is what we call in child support in-kind support, not my favorite term, but recognizing that there are more ways to support your children than just uh, how much money you're paying to the Office of Child Support, right? Um, that uh, if fathers' roles as providers, they want to feel like they are actually providing to their children. So how can we count dropping off diapers or formula or uh, what we've learned from tribal communities uh, during hunting season or when fishing, when you bring you know, the deer or the fish uh, home for your family, that counts as child support in tribal communities. Uh, how can we look at ways in which non-monetary support counts, if you will, um, so that uh, we recognize that all of the ways uh, that payers are supporting their kids, not just their financial way.
Good morning, what state am I from? Michigan, what city am I from? Detroit. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> East side. <laughs> and I am an east side. I, all, my education came from the city of Detroit and the state of Michigan. Currently, I am pursuing a doctorate degree at Bowling Green State University. And my capstone project is fatherhood. I am a retired police lieutenant from the county of Wayne. Okay. And I have been advocating for fathers for 30 years. Amen. And um, why? because I didn't see a big difference between the mother and the father other than the father's wasn't receiving support. Mm -hmm. I was over the Child Support Enforcement Agency. So it's good to, from my heart to hear that we no longer use that term and that services is um, the vernacular that we're using now. I am also the one that reached out um, when the fatherhood coalition was not ready. And so I'm ready now, you're ready, and that you will be hearing from me. I just need to know the right contact person. Um, thank you again um, for the efforts that has been placed on the fathers, most specifically in the city of Detroit. I'm grateful, I'm grateful to be here, and I'm just glad to see that we're changing, and that's what I wanna see the change, the image of my city of Detroit begins with me. And when a father comes to me, I want him to know that I got you. And I'm going to run, because this is all I get to do now, because I get my check. Amen. So thanks. No, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So that, that has to be our last uh, question. Um, but please, thanks. Um, give thanks again to Aaron Frisch, um, Damani Gray, and Demetrius Starling. Uh, for giving us some really key strategies, being very transparent about the challenges, and really talking about partnerships. Um, when you get the right systems in the room, you can make changes with policy, and I think that's a very important message.